story of MJ, Michael Jordan, the best, apparently to be debated against some LeBron fans, but um, we're not going to get into that, uh, not going to get into that this morning. Uh, so I grew up on Space Jam. I grew up on Space Jam, and there is a Space Jam 2 coming in 2021 with LeBron, so we will, yeah, again, we will determine which one was better. Uh, but I grew up on Space Jam. Anybody else at least familiar with the movie Space Jam? Some of you? Okay. Uh, and what's the message of, of Michael Jordan? Oh, okay. Let me, give us, let me give us a little bit of background. We'll go through this really quickly. Okay, Michael Jordan was cut from what? His college basketball team in his what year? Sophomore year. Okay, we don't have to have Michael Jordan memorize. That's cool. It's cool. So he's cut from the sophomore year. He goes back. He wins the national championship. We all know what goes on uh, to happen in the NBA. The core message of, of the image of Michael Jordan, right, is if we believe, we can achieve, right? It's that lesson that we shared uh, at our tables that uh, we learn at some point in our life. When we fail, if we just believe and if we try harder, eventually we will succeed right? It's this, it's this concept that we, we don't give up, and it's this concept that uh, in our minds, if we really put our minds to something, you can do whatever you want, as, as he, Papa Jordan said in, in the video. I think of, uh, for me, I think of high school baseball, and uh, I was pretty good at, at baseball um, growing up, and I was pretty good at, at pitching um, all throughout middle school, freshman, and in sophomore year, my junior year, um, I, I was starting the season number two varsity pitcher, and I go out for my, my first game, and uh, I didn't even make it through an inning, let in five runs, uh, got, got pulled from the game pretty quick, and uh, after the game, I, I uh, talking with the coach, he says, well, we're going we're gonna to send you back down to JV, and you're going to get your feet wet, and Get your confidence back, and then uh, you know you'll get a another shot. Uh, you would be really difficult to convince me that I didn't believe that I was good before that game, but I can tell you after that game happened, there was something that happened in my mindset that, that made it really difficult for me to continue believing that I was really good at pitching a baseball. And as you really work through this scenario, there's a few things that we have to think through or that I've processed throughout this, and I'm sure we have similar experiences where things didn't go the way we thought they should, and then it affects how we believe and how we think. And so for me, I was definitely, and I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but I was definitely the hardest worker on that baseball team. Uh, I put in more hours in practice than anybody. I stayed late habitually. I like lived and ate and breathed baseball. Um, so I was certainly the hardest worker. And man, I would give myself pep talks. You know, I, I will strike this guy out. I, I used all of the uh, positive thinking um, aspects of I can do this. I will do this. I will achieve this. For some reason, they just seem to keep hitting the ball. It's almost like there were other factors outside of my control that affected my success. There were other factors in addition to just simply believing and simply working harder. There were other factors at play that led to other people's success and, and not my own, right? But we've grown up in this culture and we've grown up with this idea and this lesson. You just, you fail, you just try harder, you believe, and you can achieve, right? The little engine that could? Anybody? Yeah? No, I think I can. No, I can't. You know, you know you, we believe, and if we believe, we can achieve. But we know not everyone is going to achieve, right? So we know in competition anyway that there has to be a winner and a, help me out, right? So we know in, in competition, although everyone can win, not everyone will 
win, right? What's worse is when we begin to look at areas of our lives, uh, we can find it really easy to uh, look for success, to work to achieve things, to win in one area of our lives while other areas of our lives are completely going by the wayside, right? It's really easy to zero in and, and study in intellectual pursuits, and it's very easy to let go of other things of life, whether it's physical activity. Um, it's really easy in marriage and in family life to begin to uh, focus on kids and forget to actually be one with your spouse, right? It's really easy to begin focusing on work and to let go of all the friendships and the family and all of the good and enjoyable things in life, right? It's really easy to begin to focus on certain things and to let other things go. We simply can't win at everything. And for the next couple of minutes, I just want to help us understand uh, this mindset that we, if we believe that we can achieve, if we work hard enough, eventually we'll find success. The problem with this mindset is, is twofold. Number one, in our culture, we praise winners and we blame losers. We praise winners and we blame losers. Let me go through the first one. We praise winners. I don't know anything about Michael Jordan, except he's a winner. I don't know anything about his character. I don't know anything about his integrity. I've heard rumors that he actually isn't that nice of a guy. I don't know. Right? And we can pick whatever sports star or, or celebrity or famous person we can think of, but we praise them because they win at something, but we don't ever stop to ask questions about their integrity, their character, who they are. I mean, are they actually a decent human being at home? So we praise the winners, and then we, we blame the losers. And what we mean by this is that when we lose, it's always their fault. Hence the idea, try harder and you'll succeed. So we blame the losers. When, when there's failures that happens, it's always that individuals or that team's fault. And if they would have just believed, if they would have just tried harder, then certainly they would have won. But what happens in the midst of all of this is that things get flip-flopped, right? Because if the other team would have won, we just would have said, well, you should have just believed and you should have tried harder. And the team that won, we go, yay, you guys are awesome because you won. Right? It's a it's a cycle, okay? More than all of this, uh, we can achieve without believing. So we have to believe to achieve. We have to work and try harder to find success, and we've learned this growing up. But more than this, we can achieve things without actually believing in them. For example, how many of us can state the vision statement or the mission statement of our employer? You know, one and a half hands, right? We really, uh, we, we can achieve things at work and we really don't have to believe. We don't really have to be sold out. We don't really have to be all in on things to be able to achieve certain things, right? We probably know, knew somebody growing up who was really good at something, but they really just weren't passionate about it at all. They could achieve what they wanted to, but they really didn't believe in what they were doing or have any passion behind it so we can achieve without believing that's also a problem. How this enters into our lives is this way. We often comfort ourselves by looking for things that we are good at in our lives. When things begin to uh, fall apart or when we're looking for self-affirmation or when we're looking to you know, help ourselves feel a little bit better, we start looking for what we've had success in. We start looking for what we're good at. We start looking at what we achieve. And, and Jesus was somebody who achieved a ton. In the Gospel of Luke, if you want to open up to Luke, that's where we'll be in the text the majority of times. If you want to follow along in, in your Bible, you can open up to Luke chapter 12. But in the Gospel of Luke, leading up to chapter 12, Jesus does quite a few amazing things. Uh, people that have been paralyzed. He heals them, and they're moving, and they're walking. He, uh, yeah, he does that thing too. Mind-blowing, right? Can't even get the words out. It's so crazy. Uh, 
you know, he drives out demons from, from people. He has a command over the spiritual realm. Uh, he calms uh, storms on the sea. Like, who, who does this? Right? Who, who commands nature and creation and it obeys? And more than that, he's, he's a, a, a teacher um, in, in uh, growing up in uh, Judaism, and he becomes a teacher, and, and people are amazed at his teaching. He speaks in riddles, things that don't honestly make sense. Uh, he speaks in parables and in stories. He, he gives wise teachings. It's noted that he uh, teaches as someone as having authority who can actually do what he says. It's amazing what, what Jesus does. He achieves a ton. And in the same way, like literally, uh, you know, if there was somebody in Bellevue uh, who went up to Lake Erie, split the sea in half, the lake, we'd go, I want to know about that guy. Right? Or, you know, if uh, uh, there's a group of people out on a boat in the middle of the lake and just a storm as they tend to, they just whip up out of nowhere and the boat's about to drown. And because we have satellites and all these uh, phones and social media, we know what's happening in real time. And this guy just says, you know what? Storm stop. And then, pfft, man, we'd be all over wanting to know more about how in the world did that happen, right? So in the same way as all of us would today, uh, when Jesus was achieving things, there were crowds that were drawn to his achievements. And it's here we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, and he begins by telling this story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all of my wheat and other goods. I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, split personality, it's okay. You have enough stored away for years to come. So take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for, everything you achieved in parentheses? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So no doubt this man achieved so much that he had to build bigger and bigger barns to store it all, to keep his achievements. But in the story, he missed the point of life, a rich relationship with God. If we could put that uh, last verse back up on the screen, please. Uh, verse 21, the yellow one here. Uh, let's read this together. Just join in with me. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So as we continue through the Gospel of Luke, and uh, you might want to maybe take a week or two and just read the Gospel of Luke, but as you continue through this, you're going to see a couple of things. Number one, you're going to see crowds gathering to Jesus with no strings attached. They hear of Jesus achieving things, doing miracles, doing all this cool stuff, and they just they want to come and see. Certainly, we have similar parallels today, right? I mean, we'll go watch a, like Trevor mentioned, a football game. Uh, but certainly, like, you know, we might say that it really doesn't matter who wins or loses in that football game, right? Now, some of those Ohio State or 49ers fans, you guys might argue disagree, but you don't base your life on if somebody wins or loses, right? The team makes a, a stupid decision, two stupid decisions, three stupid decisions. The team just seems to take all the wrong draft picks. The team comes back into existence after disappearing. They were resurrected from the dead. If you haven't figured out, I'm talking about the Browns. Come on, this year, Browns fans, right? This will be the year. This will be the year. Loyal to the death, man. You got to love Browns fans. Browns fans. So people gather to see people achieve things, whether it's a Super Bowl, whether it's something different or smaller. We understand what this is like. But we also see in the Gospel of Luke, the crowds disappear when Jesus calls them to believe 
in him and then to achieve what he's talking about. We see the crowds gather around Jesus and Jesus goes, you know what? You want to follow me? Let me don't get ahead of myself here. If you could skip ahead to Luke 18, uh, we're going to find that we've come to another moment when someone achieved a great deal. They achieved much. This time, Jesus isn't telling a story. He's talking to a person. This is Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. Once a religious leader, other translations say ruler, asked Jesus this question. Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It's a common question, right? One way that we ask this or we hear it is, what must I do to get into heaven? It's another rephrase of a similar question. Let's see how Jesus responds. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is good. It's like the Riddler from Batman. Jesus is asked a question and he just we're not talking about that, Jesus. We're trying to talk about what I must do to inherit eternal life. Like, and you want to talk about good, right? So a couple of cultural things that, that could be happening. Uh, one, throughout the Old Testament, to say that something is good was to refer to it as though it was um, in essence of God himself. So the phrase good teacher would have basically been reserved for saying God teacher. That's possibility of what could be happening here. So Jesus goes on, and, and Jesus seems to begin to test him to see if he's really considering Jesus to be God as he's calling him good teacher. Another aspect could be if, if God is only good, as Jesus says, then by default, everyone else is not good. Right? So if only God is good, by default, then everyone else would be not good, and to be not good would mean to be to fail at something, somewhere, at some time. So let's go on with what Jesus says. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. And in short, it sounds like this. Be a good person. Right? In short, it sounds like be a good person, but a little piece of Bible trivia. Does anyone know what Jesus left off at the end of this list? You shall not covet. Jesus gives a list of commandments. He leaves off, you shall not covet. This is important for us to understand. Verse 21, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young, not including the one you shall not covet. I can imagine Jesus here, like, you know, talking with this guy, he says, I've obeyed the, the commandments uh, since I was young. I can imagine Jesus going to be like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Hmm. Oh, that's right. I know. Or maybe he gets a smirk. I don't know. But when Jesus hears his answer, he says, there's one thing you still haven't done. Sell all of your possessions. Give the money to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But before we even go forward in the story, I want to acknowledge three things that's happening here. One, Jesus doesn't require this of everyone to sell everything that they have and to come and follow him, right? It's not something that is a standard for every single person to do, right? If that were true, all of us in here would be, I don't know, homeless or in one big commune. Right? So it's not, a, it's not a prerequisite for every person, but it is something that Jesus is asking of this person. So we have to reconcile with Jesus is asking from this person, and he sets the bar really, really high. Two, Jesus didn't say that this person, the ruler, was a hypocrite for saying that he obeyed all the commandments that Jesus had listed. We would think that Jesus would have full authority to go, you know what? You know, I remember that time when you were seven. I heard what you said to your mama. Right? We would think if, if anybody could get into a debate on if you've actually fulfilled these certain commandments that Jesus listed, it would be Jesus himself. But he doesn't go into that. 
He doesn't go into that at all. Uh, I thought of a riddle, and some of you might get it, some of you might not. It might be something to think about, uh, but it's related to this. And if it's cheesy, just forgive me, but I'm going to just lay it out. Here it is. Here is the riddle. If I can't give it, I covet. If I can't give it, I covet. You can thank me later if you want to think on that over lunch or, you know. Uh, So then the third thing that I don't want us to forget here is that following Jesus always costs something. Following Jesus always costs something. It may not be everything that we own, but following Jesus will always cost something. Whether it's changing a profession, whether it's um, getting into a new group of influences and friends, whether it's changing our habits and the way that we think even something, following Jesus will always cost us something. Verse 22, let's continue on. But when the man heard this, he became very sad. For he was very rich. Right? And we can identify here. This is what we do. Uh, when, when Jesus asks us of something that he doesn't ask other people, and uh, it seems hard and makes us start to itch, right? Turn a little red. We get sad. We get a little bit angry. We get a little bit irritated. Or we just become indifferent. We go, you know what? I don't think, no, I'm not going to do that. Right? Uh, But when Jesus asks us to give up something, it's so that we can more completely follow him. Following Jesus will always cost us something. Verse 24, when Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And here, Jesus begins to attack a common idea in their time, and I think, if we're honest, it's still a common idea in our time, it's that successful people are close with God. Now, let me unpack that for about two minutes. It's easy for us as Christians to look at people who we would say, in our judgment, yeah, you probably, I don't know if your behavior reflects following Jesus, right? And then they have a money, and then we conclude, you know, they got the money otherwise. But let me flip the idea here and really expose how, how we, we think. If we think the minute that we begin to follow Jesus that our life must get better, we believe that following Jesus will make us successful. We believe that if lives get better as a result of following Jesus, if that's our, our thought, our paradigm, when things begin to go bad, we really become really frustrated. And not that frustration is a bad thing, and not that it's not okay, because it is okay. It's emotions that we feel, but it's also thoughts that we have to wrestle with. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Jesus would say, you know, if you're not willing to leave your entire family and come and follow me, you're not worthy. And we just tend to skip over that. We tend to go, ah, Jesus is talking to those people, but I'm cool. When Jesus makes other statements along that line, we get the we get the point here. So Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 25, in fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's a hyperbole statement. Basically it means it's impossible. Then those who heard this said, Well, then who can be saved, Jesus? Because we're here with you, and if you're saying that no one can be saved, if it's impossible, then like, who can be saved, Jesus? Verse 27, he replied, What is impossible for people is possible with God. And so it's not on our achievement, but on his achievement, that we can follow Jesus not on our achievement, but on his achievement, that we can follow Jesus. We don't, you know, read the Bible. We don't pray. We don't earn our way into following Jesus. It's based off of something that Jesus achieved and an invitation that he gave. Right? 
We tend to look at spiritual disciplines and we achieve them. We check them off the list. And spiritual disciplines are good things to practice, yes. But it is based on his achievement. Raising himself from the dead, as we remember on Easter Sunday. It's based on that achievement that we can follow Jesus. But it's at this point the disciples in the story, they weigh in because they're all in. And they um, uh, weren't necessarily poor. So fishermen and specifically tax collectors, that would be that person that we talk, talked or considered a few moments ago. Like, you know, they've got a lot of money and we know that they're not cool with God. But then Matthew is invited to follow Jesus. He becomes cool with God. And what happened to his money? Scripture doesn't say that he had to give it all away. So all this to say, not all of the disciples were like dirt poor. Verse 28, Peter said, Jesus We've left our homes to follow you. And yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you, Peter and everyone else, who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and have eternal life in the world to come. Back to the question that the rich ruler asked. What's happening here? A couple of things for clarification. Number one, giving up. Um, in this context is is foregoing for a time to enter into itinerant ministry with Jesus. We can think of it this way, uh, leaving family for a season or for a moment to be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus, but not to abandon family responsibilities. It's not like the disciples who were married, they had to divorce to follow Jesus. That is not the point that's happening here. They didn't just say goodbye to their families and whatever, but in the context, they gave up their family for a time. How many years did Jesus have public ministry? Three. That's a hard sell. That's a, that's a hard sell. Three years. Just give up on what we know and to go into what Jesus is asking of them. That's Jesus' point here. Giving up something for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now what comes next, it seems not related, but I'm telling you, Jesus isn't like teaching or leading in just theory. He's living this out as an example. So what comes next, although it's probably separated in your Bibles with a new heading, I'm telling you it is connected to what we just read, verse 31. Taking the 12 disciples aside. So they just have some hard conversation. They take him aside and Jesus says, like, hey guys, listen. We're going up to Jerusalem. And I just want to let you know where this is where all the predictions of the prophets, where they're all concerning the Son of Man, where they're all going to come true. I just want to give you a heads up on that. That the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Romans. He's going to be beaten mocked, treated shamefully, spit upon. They're going to flog him. They're going to whip him. They're going to kill him. Guys, check this out. On the third day, he will rise again. Jesus, I thought we were talking about entering into eternal life. What are you talking about? And you can see if you're following along in your, in your uh, uh, e-Bible or your tree Bible, right? They didn't get it. The disciples were confused. See, Jesus was giving them a little bit of a hint that Jesus is going to give up something for the sake of the kingdom of God. And by something, he's going to give up everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. Jesus is going to completely empty himself and give of himself so that others can enter into eternal life. It's amazing what Jesus is teaching and, and what he's doing. And so achievement, as we've read through this, achievement is not found in giving, but in getting. Wait, nope, I said that backwards. I need y'all to keep me accountable here. You guys got the slide on the screen too. Uh, achievement is found in giving, not getting. No, I did say it right. How is achievement found? In giving and not getting. 
So like, how do we define success? Oh. Oh. How do we define success? Oh. That's not cool, Jesus. And it's back to this concept that we've learned our whole lives. That if we fail, we try harder, that we'll succeed, we'll get. But Jesus is calling us to think a different way and to begin seeing that success or achievement is found in giving and not getting. And then he gives us an example where he quite literally gives himself so that we can enter into eternal life. Man, Jesus is amazing. And like a really high challenge and like a little uncomfortable because like I want what I want. Jesus says success isn't getting what you want. Success is giving yourself to others. Success is entering into a rich relationship with God, not building bigger bonds. Success is sacrificing and giving something up and following me, not filling blank. And now we know why the crowds disappeared. Jesus is calling us to a life of sacrifice. It's not really exciting. But it's his way. And it's what we have to learn. So when we say we believe in Jesus, Yet when we focus only on achieving other things, we're deceiving ourselves. When we say we believe in Jesus, but all of our focus goes towards achieving other things in life, if that happens, we are deceiving ourselves. We may believe in one sense of the term, but we're certainly not all in is what Jesus is asking of us. James, brother of Jesus, says it this way in in his letter. says that you believe. That's good. Even demons believe and they shudder. But faith isn't just believing. Faith is seen by our actions. Faith is seen by what we do. And this is where it begins to get a few, a little bit confusing because faith is seen by what we achieve, in a sense. It's seen by what we do. And so what is our next step? Each and every one of us. My guess is that Jesus is asking something of, of us individually that he's not requiring of the person sitting right next to you. My guess is that the Spirit of God, probably even before this morning, was already speaking to you about something that may not be for the the person on your left or on your right or at the table over. Just like the rich ruler, Jesus was asking him to get rid of everything to come and follow him because there was one commandment he missed. You shall not covet. He didn't want to give it up. The deduction is because he is full of covetousness. And that's the grace of Jesus. That even though we still have tendencies to covet, to be not good, simply, that as we do our best to sacrifice, to give of ourselves, to follow him, he steps in and he brings us into his kingdom on his achievement and not our own. On his power, not ours. 
as amazing grace of God, our Savior, Jesus, our Lord, and Messiah that we have in him.